notably what chapter three mentions about social media in this case goes into these three specific topics and that one is kind of oversimplified here is the media is the message um, which is a phrase from Marshall McLuhan a very very famous media scholar we'll talk a little bit about our customers and give you some examples some we've already gone over but um, a lot of this is a little bit of a rehash of David Merriman Scott um, so I'm kind of glad this is a little bit of a short week because uh, well uh, for this particular class at least um, but it will make it a little easier to cover over and quickly too since we covered over a lot of this stuff in David Merriman Scott and then the 80-20 rule this goes into a little bit of something different that David Merriman Scott didn't mention but your book does um, tomorrow I'm hoping that I'll get to uh, talk about ethics I don't think I'll have time to finish it today uh, if I do that's great but ethics will be very important in terms of and the ideologies of what it means to have social media um, and advertising within this. So um, first and foremost, let's let's take a look at the social media landscape and to what we're talking about with the medium is the message here. And to start that off, we talk about, again, Marshall McLuhan. Now, granted, this is a very old quote from Marshall McLuhan, um, and mainly talking about how each technological revolution started kind of changing the way that we communicate. And so um, in many cases we talk about radio or we talk about television in this case in terms of how we've progressed um, in these media revolutions. And he would even go into talking about the tribal epoch, the print epoch, the literacy ed epoch. Again, that's not in order, but um, we get into this area of communication and the messages change because the media changes. And you might want to think of a couple examples of where you've seen that in your own life uh, in terms of how people talk. Um, and the biggest thing we mention is um, the ideology of when people are starting, let's take for example, walking around with their cell phones. So it used to be with the internet, it was only accessible through your computer or you could pay an arm and a leg to use it uh, on like a flip phone or something. But uh, obviously it's extremely easy to access it now, uh, provided you have a smartphone. Um, and in many ways, Marshall McLuhan has a point in the uh, instance of talking about how we communicate differently based on that type of, um, type of medium that's being introduced. And so there's a lot of research. In fact, I, I've been a part of a research project that was really cool that talked about the perceptions of things like face-to-face -face versus what's called CMC, which is Computer Mediated Communication. And the interesting thing was, I, you know, I was working with a colleague who is probably one of the most prolific scholars in this particular field that I know about. And, you know, extremely intelligent um, a lot of fun to listen to, very charismatic guy by the name of Nicholas Bowman, um, and he's at West Virginia University. When we were at a conference, he talked a lot about this whole notion of training people into the dynamics of computer-mediated communication, and that, you know, face-to-face -face and CMC, they're not perfect, but they are methods of communication. And this also... Uh, comes into play in terms of how we're communicating differently nowadays. Are we communicating differently? Um, and in the research that we conducted was the notion that we hold this value of face-to-face -face so highly, but we also recognize that there is a lot of benefits to computer and BDAD communication um, that we don't really recognize, even though we consider face-to-face -face as very perfect communication. And it's, it's definitely not. Um, and one of the aspects of that that I thought was really interesting that one of my colleagues brought up was the whole notion of, you know, a lot of people see it as a weakness that on social media, and if you're communicating through a computer, you have time to create a response. Well, what is the biggest thing? And, you know, they say for face-to-face, -face, you get more authenticity if you're not because you, you get that response instantaneously. And while on face value, that seems like a very 
much a, a good thing for face to face, you know, are we always trying to say to people, uh, think before you talk, <laughs> which is naturally the objective here in CMC is that that's what we're doing. We're trying to craft a better formulaic message to send to the next person. And it may take a while, but, um, in, in this case, we are doing a lot of thinking before we actually communicate. And so that's just one example. Another one we could look at is, uh, the research article presented by another one of my colleagues. Um, granted, he didn't come up with the theory, but he formulized some additional research for it. Um, it's called displacement effect, which means that every piece of new technology that is invented means that we kind of displace old ones. Um, I don't know if this is inherently true by itself, but there is definitely some justification for why this may be something we should consider. Um, and especially when we look at things like social media, I mentioned that our millennial demographics as well as Gen Z, uh, which is our newly established demographic, uh, primarily Facebook isn't used as much versus things like Snapchat. But if you think about it, the whole notion of Snapchat versus Facebook messaging is, again, almost an interpersonal effect where we can send to a group of people, to one person in particular. We can create life stories. It's it's a very interesting project of how we promote uh, this whole notion of replacing something. So again, we can promote this as, I'm starting to use Snapchat instead of Facebook, for example, and I displace um, Facebook with the newly found Snapchat in this case. So again, as our technology advances, as we're getting more and more used to uh, different ways of doing things, I mean, this is like the newspaper, uh, newspaper versus how we're viewing news now. I mean, the, some of the arguments are the best spots for news nowadays is in wikis. I mean, this is why we're referencing WikiLeaks all the time during the election season. Um, it's a very important and interesting way that we're collecting news in this case. And it's um, very quick to come out. So, um, you know, these are the areas where Marshall McLuhan definitely has some ground to stand on um, in terms of this media and the message. And so breaking it down a little bit, you know, I, I do promote and talk about looking at Facebook. Now, this is just a bunch of Lauren Ipsum's of an example page here. But think about this in the way of how you particularly look at your Facebook, um, if you have one, is first and foremost, what stands out? What is it that, the, you know, you gather out of looking at a page in terms of uh, areas within the left column, um, and that area in terms of groups, friends, apps, pages, favorites, that kind of thing, versus, you know, using this as kind of the middle, ta or, uh, middle column, almost as a news feed is what they call it, um, but how we browse through it. So how we browse through particular pieces of information. Um, you know, last night, unfortunately, was the Las Vegas shooting, and so that was quite a bit in terms of talking about what was going on in the middle here. And that's kind of how I got my information to start the morning. Um, and then I looked at news sources out there afterwards. And that's kind of what they call a two-step flow, which again, very sad. Um, but it does bring up an interesting point in terms of, again, the way we post. Now I'm going to get off of this particular news story I was just talking about. And think of things like the severity of how we express interest and liking towards something. So for years, the metric that Facebook used was the like button. So if you go down and you see this particular view is a very pretty view, you can press the like button. Now granted, this won't work in this particular case just because this is just a image and not an actual Facebook post. But now we have loves instead and um, you know, laughing faces, crying faces, angry faces. I think the most interesting thing about that is you can look at terms of the severity of how much you like something. So let's say um, my uh, my nephew, for example, is um, going to be baptized here soon, and my wife and I are going up north to uh, to witness this and be a part of it. 
um, which is really cool. Um, but the thing is, you know, my, my in-laws post quite frequently about it, and, you know, we're all really looking forward to it. And the notion is, do I like something versus I express this endorsement of my identity that I'm saying I do like something. And again, that's partially put into a metric here versus if I were to say, I love it. Um, and again, that shows not only this representation of identity, but again, it's almost like you're promoting the difference between like and love, um, which is also really interesting in terms of the metrics that are on Twitter, for instance. So when you like something, you press a heart button that represents, in this case, love. And it has been in really interesting studies since Facebook has promoted this idea of the like and love button that people on Twitter are kind of uh, a little jarred of saying, I like this post, but I don't know if I'd go so far as to say I love it. Then again, think about that, how that changes everything in terms of the way Facebook um, kind of messed with the message complexity. So again, what are you first looking at? What are you omitting? A lot of people um, in previous research studies would mention that the right-hand side where all the advertisements are or ideally, or not ideally, are unfortunately what's being left out, um, which makes sense because we, lead, we read light right to left. And so if you're looking somebody into graphic designs, this has to be very well organized. And if, for the most part, it is. But at the same time, are we getting the best out of our buck when it comes to advertising over here, which is why in many cases we sometimes have advertising on the left-hand side. So, in terms of, again, changing how we communicate, all these are examples of how it may change the dynamic of how we talk to each other. Um, and so why should this matter to a media planner? Well, we, again, get into the notion of likes and loves, for instance. If you have a, a, a post, for example, that is promotional and a lot of people are loving it, uh, which rarely happens, but where it does happen a lot is through good corporate social responsibility, you know, indicating that you're taking care of your employees, you're taking care of the, the, the environment, that kind of thing, and to where a lot of people will plug these, their uh, symbol for loving this post, and it really goes to show you what kind of posts are typically enjoyed the most by your uh, stakeholders, by, your, by the public, etc. So how can the medium change the message? So you notice here this whole monstrosity of media clutter. Again, that's an image. And we say, does this infuriate you? Well, it should. Because this is the entire definition of media clutter and thus making it extremely ineffective, or ineffective, excuse me, um, to be able to view. And it's funny because we've talked to quite a little, a lot in terms of advertising professionals um, that I've talked to have said, you know, we're really getting away from this whole notion of pop-ups. We know it's annoying. We know people hate it. So we're, you know, we're going to stop doing that. But what they don't realize is that they have um, methods of pop-ups in terms of the way that they do banner ads. So some you would scroll down in an extended period of time and the ad would appear and then gradually disappear as you kept scrolling. Or you would, the ESPN does this a lot, just for as, as an example, is they will have a clip up on the regular website, and as you're sitting there looking at it, it will expand to fill up, you know, half the screen until uh, a, a, a little bit of period of time where it will shrink again, which, again, we'll talk a lot about, but a lot of people find that annoying and, and, and off-putting. So... In this case, we go back to our beloved uses and gratifications and say, what's the purpose of being on social media is being social. What do we use it for? Again, this whole ideology of CMC and computer-mediated communication in terms of being social. Uh, and then how supposed to be selling on, uh, in on it? And that's the tricky question then. And so to look at that, we talk about the new creativity. And so, David, Mir, and Scott, this is a lot of what we were talking about, is this conceptualization of relationship selling. 
<laughs> and we looked at this in terms of the Chilean miners. This is actually a picture of it. But again, forty million dollars, forty-one million dollars of exposure, based on just a simple thing of, you know, handing some sunglasses to a group of miners and making the ex their experience so they don't have to deal with the harsh light of day as they can arise. Um, another good example is the whole Wendy's Twitter and social media being social. This is one of my personal favorite ones of how much does a Big Mac cost? And they respond with your dignity. Um, again, Wendy's kind of poking fun and using this online identity of being uh, trolls or savage or whatever it's being called nowadays. But it's very personal. And this is where we deal with parasocial relationships or interaction. Well, in this case, this is a social interaction done by a company. So we don't know the PR person behind Wendy's Twitter, but what we do know is what we see from the response that's being given uh, from the message from David Peacock, in this case, to what Wendy stated. And in this case, this is a social interaction. They are talking to us. And this is one of the reasons why celebrity endorsers have really taken off nowadays uh, versus how much they were influential back, um, you know, even 20, 30, 40 years ago. Um, they've become more popular than ever because they've been given this humanizing persona, um, which for the longest time was really only introduced in uh, if you went to go and visit a celebrity at a thing like a Comic-Con or something. Now... They're on talk shows everywhere, and, and the grand talk shows are nothing new here, but we really have taken it to the next level of promoting celebrities in a completely different light. Um, and they do a very good job in promoting this seamless and personal interaction and creating good parasocial relationships. So that's the medium of the message. The last thing we're going to cover over today is our customers. So social medium means that your customers will be social, which typically can be very good. You want your consumers to be social. You want them to almost treat what you're doing as a form. You know, as mentioned for a student that normally might, um, and I'm not saying the person who emailed me this morning, um, might be shy or introverted or anything, but I know a lot of students in the past that if I did something incorrectly or something that they would prefer, the notion is that with anonymity, for instance, of being anonymous, they're, they're more likely to be able to speak a little bit more of their mind. So granted, um, the emails I got today were obviously identifiable. However, uh, it makes it a little easier to be able to talk in a fashion that's, you know, saying that I, I need help with this. And this has actually been in, this is probably one of my favorite research instances where people who were dealing with psychological um, distress and mental illness would talk to um, psychologists via online and they were very willing to open up because they knew they wouldn't be identified. This is the same with um, suicide prevention. In other words, I might be getting a little off track in this case, but it can be very good to have that notion of um, I can communicate with this particular brand and give them honest feedback. Whereas if I were in a focus group um, in terms of their research, you know, if you're an introverted person, you might not speak up. And that can be really detrimental for a company if you have some major problem and your voice isn't being heard in this case. So... But it also can be bad in, in many ways, and I won't get into some major ways. Obviously, there's some groups that, you know, having that anonymity may not be necessarily a good thing of spreading poor rhetoric. Um, and again, I'm not going to get into details of what that rhetoric might be. But, um, you know, a well-placed message or a badly placed message can circulate through your audience quickly, which, again, goes back into that media funnel in Chapters 2 of Media Flight Plan that talk about this whole notion of word of mouth. And now that it has a mass communication channel, you know, it used to be the old maxim of if you don't like a restaurant, and, or excuse me, if you like a restaurant, you'll tell one person. But if you don't like a restaurant, you'll tell 10 people. 
Well, now we have the notion of going viral in this case. So some of the good examples, uh, I probably mentioned this one before in terms of Mellow Mushroom. This was the picture from it of her husband being in Iraq, um, overseas in the military, sending a pizza to his wife um, while he was overseas. It was her birthday, and it was really cool, and a very cool story to really bring about um, this whole notion of good PR by Mel Mushroom, and they really didn't have to do much after that. Again, uh, diffusions of innovation took over, and so these customer reviews as this special experience can result in very cheap but very effective exposure in this case. Whereas another example, now you, you may not recognize this picture um, before, uh, some of you may, some of you won't. Um, this uh, particular one is uh, the Challenger explosion uh, back when Ronald Reagan was in office and unfortunately this was a trip to uh, be in outer space and unfortunately it exploded before it got into um, out of our atmosphere. Well, unfortunately, the American Apparel Company used this to say that this was uh, for fireworks. Well, you know, poorly used um, imagery in terms of this one in particular, which they posted. Um, I could find the actual example of them posting on uh, social media, but it was all over these PR websites that were talking about bad media blunders and their apology was a little too little too late because again you know the damage was kind of already done in terms of posting something that they really shouldn't have and you may say to yourself well that's kind of inevitable um, that you're gonna post something now granted not to this extremity probably but you're gonna post something stupid you're gonna realize that the reference material that you plan on using isn't exactly what you wanted to post so what do you do? Um, in some cases, it's usually time heals all wounds. Um, and that's sometimes true. There are usually some instances where um, time doesn't heal all wounds and you just have to roll with the punches that you got, unfortunately, and realize that some people will never shop at your company. The one example that I have here is that I've mentioned before in terms of uh, DiGiorno. And so this was the Why I Stayed, Why I Left campaign, and unfortunately talking about domestic violence. And um, although the hashtag by itself was an incredible way of that anonymity of talking about, you know, again, the issue of domestic violence, trying to create a social media environment to help uh, other people who have been through this. Well, unfortunately, DiGiorno kind of got into the mix of saying Why I Stayed, which was you had pizza. And again, that was considered a major media blunder. But in this case, uh, issue, issuing individual apologies. And you'll see over on the left here, every single one of these is different. And there were much, much more. This was just the screenshot that was taken and that I, I utilized for this particular um, PowerPoint. But it is something to think about in terms of the notion of, yes, it's very difficult to to be able to fight off backlash. Um, there are obviously different methods. You, you pray for a hoax and being able to recover from that hoax. Again, issue with a Pepsi Corporation with somebody finding a syringe in one of their cans. It turned out all to be a hoax. However, again, being able to investigate and being able to go into um, William Benoit's um, strategies of apologia if you ever want to look that up, it's either Apologia or Apologia. I've seen both. But it is getting to this notion of, again, in this case, remorse and mortification and corrective action are the ways to remedy this situation as best as possible. So um, that's all I'm going to go over today. I'll touch base on the 80-20 rule and ethics on, um, or well, tomorrow, uh, and then go over the homework on Thursday. So or Wednesday, excuse me, my goodness, um, I need to get some sleep. <laughs> so I hope you all are doing well. Um, that's all I'm going to cover for today, and uh, I'll talk to you tomorrow. All right, thanks. Have a good day.